he started this series a couple of weeks ago on the ingredients of a healthy church. And, and we ran across this phrase last week, they devoted themselves to. And remember, devoting themselves to actually in the Greek means to persistently and consistently do something with intensity. And our primary focus last week was then persistently and consistently with intensity, focusing on the apostles' teaching. And I want to continue that thought because I wasn't able to get all the way through uh, uh, the, the message that I wanted to do. I wanted to continue that thought today with giving you some tools to help you understand what truth is when it comes to God's word and what everybody else is saying out there. In 2016, the word of the year was post-truth. And post-truth means that objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Now, author Abdu Murray, who wrote wrote a fascinating book called Saving Truth, points out that although post-truth dates back to 1992, the usage in 2016 ballooned 2,000%. It seems like more and more today that our culture does not live by objective truth, which we all understand that because people walk around saying my truth and not the truth. We don't live by objective truth anymore. Rather, we live by what I call emotional responses. Emotional responses. In other words, we don't want to get the facts in the way of feelings. However, as we look at it from an external standpoint, and I talked about this last week a little bit, not only is the culture around us sliding further and further into this hyper-emotional culture, the Western church seems to be more and more governed by emotions rather than the truth of the word, and it has actually left us powerless and anemic. We can no longer confront the culture around us because we don't even know what truth is in the house of God. And it's the prophet who says that judgment starts in the house of God first. And so for the last 10 years, I've been on this relentless quest to help people understand truth and why it matters and why we have to cling to the truth. This isn't in my notes, but we we look at prophecy for a second. And prophecy has two aspects to it. You have foretelling, which is telling the future, and you have foretelling, which is telling the truth. And here's the thing. When you look at the prophets of old, they do a primary, their primary mission is to tell the truth, foretelling rather than foretelling. And oftentimes in the church, we don't want to tell the truth. We want to live by an emotional response. We want to live by a tingly feeling. We want to live by some sort of voice in the air. And we end up sliding the word of God over here and focusing on our own feelings. And yet Jeremiah says this, that your feelings, the heart is deceptively wicked. Who can trust it? I had a pastor friend. I used to pastor a church or pastor a church plant in Hartsville, Alabama. And Hartsville is a small community outside of Huntsville, Alabama, where it's, it's kind of like Visalia Tulare. It's, it was a small area. And he would get up and say things like, I don't need doctrine or theology. I just need to, I just need more of Jesus. And I would always bring him into the office and we'd talk and I would go, which Jesus? Because it's doctrine and theology that actually teaches you who Jesus is. The word of God is not written on accident. The word of God is God's revealed plan for us. It is doctrine and theology that teaches us rightly about the God we serve. It's doctrine and theology that shows us who God is, what he has done for us and why he has done it, as well as our response to that message. Living a Christian life without understanding doctrine and theology is like the term catfishing. How many have ever heard the term catfishing? 
And I'm not talking about like throwing a line out and fishing. I'm not talking about noodling, that type of stuff they do in Oklahoma where they stick their hand in a hole, let the catfish grab on, and they wrestle that catfish out of the hole. That is a true thing that I've never done and I have no care to do. But catfishing is this modern term. And for those of you who don't understand it, basically it came along with the advent of social media. And basically somebody will take a picture of someone else and pretend to be that someone else. And so there are whole shows written or, or, or shown about catfishing where these people fall in love with the image on the screen and they're like, I love this person. They're my soulmate. I, 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 we're in love. And you go, well, did you ever meet them? No, I've never met them. Well, have you spent any time on FaceTime? No, haven't spent any time on FaceTime. Have you called them on the phone? No, but we're in love. As a matter of fact, there was this young girl named Ellie Flynn who had 60 fake accounts that used her image. Her imposters ranged from old ladies to men to young girls. And here's what she says in, in, in the story. She says, over the years, my friends and I have met a number of young men who spent a substantial amount of time chatting to fake me or fake versions of the one of my friends online. One boy from uh, one boy had been speaking to a fake version of my friend every night for 2 months and he believed he was in love with her. The problem was none of these accounts were real. You see living a Christian life without doctrine and theology is getting a sense of God, but never knowing the true God. Doctrine and theology are essential to you really knowing and understanding and worshiping God. Now, running alongside of this problem of us not understanding doctrine and theology is us not being able to critically think as believers. Harry Blameyers writes a fascinating book called The, the Christian Mind, and Mark Knoll writes a book called The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind, and both are fascinating, talking about the demise of thinking in the Western church. Now, here's what you have to understand. God, Jesus, when he's proclaiming what is the greatest out there, the greatest law, he, he repeats what's known as, as the Shema, which is this statement of Israel, the Lord, the Lord your God is one. You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So think about it this way. Actually engaging in thinking is an act of worship. And here's what Blameyer says in his book. He says, there's no longer a Christian mind. The Christian mind has succumbed to secular drift with a degree of weakness and nervelessness unmatched in Christian history. It's difficult to do justice in words to complete loss of intellectual morale in the 21st century. He says this, the bland assumption that the church's life will continue to be fruitful so long as we go praying and cultivating souls, irrespective of whether we trouble to think and talk Christianly and therefore theologically about anything we or others may do may turn out to have dire results. Do you know why there's a terrible spread of evangelism in the church while no one is evangelizing? Because we've disengaged our mind. We no longer think. And here's what I know, the more, the less and less you get of God's word in your life, the less and less impact you will have in the community and the world around you. The erosion of truth matched with lack of critical thinking makes Paul's command to, the, to Timothy all the more important. Look at it, 2 Timothy 2.15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Now, you think about that statement for a second. If Paul is saying you are to rightly handle the word of truth, then there obviously is a wrong way to handle the word of truth. Otherwise, he wouldn't write it. Now, Paul urges Timothy to handle the word of truth because it's the word of truth that gives us a true image of who God is. And God gave us his word to reveal himself to us. 
And we live in a day and age where too many people are playing fast and loose with the word of God. And, and so today, what I want to do, that was just my introduction, but what I want to do today is I want us to look at Paul's last letter in 2 Timothy 3. Now again, this is just part of the whole series. Next week, we'll talk about prayer. And the week after that, we'll talk about community. And the week after that, we'll talk about mission. But I feel it is so important in every church I go to to help you understand truth and how to discern it. This is a lengthy scripture, so I want you to follow along with me. 2 Timothy 3, he says this, but understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, avoid such people. Now, let me pause for a moment and make some commentary on this. People ask me all the time, Jason, do you think we're living in the last days? And I say, yes, but probably not for the reason you think we're living in the last days. Jesus said, we'll always have wars and rumors of wars and disease, and there will always be earthquakes and famines and all this kind of stuff. If you read Jesus's all of it discourse, he makes a break between those two, but I don't have time to go into that. But the reason I think we're living in the last days is there's no better time than right now that I see that people are lovers of themselves, lovers of money, and having the appearance of godliness. Verse 6. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of truth. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. Paul's referring to his steadfastness or his faithfulness to persecution here. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. So while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you've learned it. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. What makes you complete? Scripture. And then he says this to Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. Look what he says. He's connecting the dots here. He's saying, Timothy, you've learned all this. You've developed all this. The culture is going this way. The word will do this. And then he says this, preach the word, not preach your opinion, not preach your emotion, but preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Verse 3, for a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth. They will wander off into myths. So as for you, always be sober-minded, enduring suffering, enduring and do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. Paul writes this as one of his very last words he'll ever write. Second Timothy is his last letter he will ever write before he's executed. And I told you last week that Paul's writing it on purpose to help Timothy understand that the priority is the Word of God. The priority is to point people to the truth. And here's what I know. You can't point people to the truth unless you yourself know and understand the truth itself. So in short, the Word of God has vital implications and it helps us understand the truth in the world. And really, at the end of the day, the Word of God gives us discernment 
in this age. So today what I want to talk to you about is discernment. Because discernment is absolutely vital. People will have an appearance of holiness and godliness, but they are drifting from their word to their own pleasures, their own idea of what truth is. And it is maddening, isn't it? I mean, when you walk around today and you have to go, so what is your pronoun? It's crazy. It, it's, it's insane, really. And I know I'm speaking to the choir and I, I don't want to bring any condemnation because I know that people get bound in all kinds of sin. I understand that. But the world we live in feels really unsettling. Have you ever been in a bounce house before? I don't get into them anymore because I'm an insurance liability. But have you ever been bouncing on a trampoline or a bounce house with your kids? And, and they're just like, ah! Because kids are rubber and they can fall on things and not break. But as you get older, you're like, everything breaks. I even injure myself in my sleep. Don't know how that's happening. But have you ever gotten in a bounce house and it just feels so unsteady and you're working hard just to stay upright? And my friends, this is the time that we're living in. Is that everything feels out of whack. Everything feels topsy-turvy, and we're just trying to catch our breath. And what happens with a lot of churches is in this time period, in this culture that we're living, we can't even evangelize because we're just trying to hold on. And I think that the church has to continue to discern what truth is. And here's the thing, the church, listen. Ah. I'm the interim pastor, so I can say this. We've gotten so wrapped up into politics and to things of the culture that we have lost our prophetic voice in the culture in which we live. So I, 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 I've made this statement when I was pastoring, and I made some people mad because they were always like, Pastor, will you tell us who to vote for? Pastor, which person should I vote for? And I started telling them, look, as a pastor and as the church, I have to be above politics. You have to be above politics. Yeah, you have a civic duty to vote. Don't misunderstand me. But what we've done is we have abdicated our prophetic voice to legislation to take our hands off of it. I'll, I'll tell you a story. This isn't even in my notes. I'll tell you a story. I worked with my church board for two or three years in Grapevine, and I kept telling them, guys, we need to be prepared because what we do is we go, hey, sinner, come out of that sin, and yet we don't have anything that we offer them. And, and I'll talk a little bit about this next week or the week after when we're talking about community. You know why the disciples took everything and shared it? Because people were leaving their their old ancestral faith, stepping into a new one, and sometimes they were completely cut off from their families. So they had nothing. So I'd been working with my board. I said, guys, you know, think about issues of LGBTQ. We're asking people who may be partnered with someone else where their income's partnered with someone else, and we're asking them to repent and come out of that lifestyle. We better have money set aside so that if somebody breaks apart from that lifestyle, we can house them, we can help them, we can be Jesus with skin on. And I, I would say the same thing about the Islamic faith or anything like that. Well, I was in Europe on a missions trip, and I get my phone started blowing up, you know, like at three o'clock in the morning. And a girl in our church who was uh, special needs, who was married, who had a kid, uh, got pregnant. Now, all they could do as a special needs family is drive DoorDash. That's all they could do. And she wrecked her car. And her dad, that they relied on, said this, I'll buy you a new car if you get an abortion. 
So my phone was blowing up with my board members. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? I said, look, I get back tomorrow. Let's meet. And I met with them. And I said, uh, I said, guys, and this was a test, but I said, guys, look, you're wanting to do all this stuff. You wanting to buy a car. You're wanting to help her with medical bills. I said, guys, you're talking about fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. We're a smaller church, a church of 300. You know, we had a healthy budget, but like $50,000 would still be painful. I had a board member, his name was Bill, one of my favorite people on the entire planet, looked at me and said, Pastor, what's it cost to save a human life? So that next evening, I went to the family and I sat down with them and I said, look, we're going to take care of this baby. We're going to take care of the family. We're going to stock the food pantries. We're going to drive her to every single appointment. We're going to buy her a car da, 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 until that baby's adopted. If you will allow us to do that, we'll pay for everything. And the dad was gruff. He was... All right, pastor. If you do what you say you're going to do, All right, so we did. Our women's ministry took her to every single doctor's appointment, sat there through ultrasounds with her. Every week we spent four or $500 of church money filling their pantry. We bought them a, mm, about a one-year-old car with 15,000 miles on it. Today that baby's five years old. Little boy lives in Fort Worth, Texas. The point is, and I don't even know what the point is. I need to refer to my notes, but the point is, is we live in really complex times. And sometimes we're so prone to emotion and we don't think our way through things and we just kind of react. And the church right now is in this react, reactionary mode where we're, we feel like everything is encroaching upon us, right? That we're like, Katie, bar the doors. This is the Alamo. This is the last bastion of truth. And, and, and so what we end up doing is we want to align with politics or people and go, if you will just take care of this for us. No, 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 listen. You want to know the problem for the culture out there? It's not legislation. It's not more politicians. For heaven's sake, we have too many politicians as it is. The antidote for the world out there is a church led by the Spirit, full of faith, and speaking to culture and with culture. Does that make sense? So what we have to do is we have to discern. And if you think that this is just a light and momentary problem, let me just run you through a few verses. Jesus confronted truth time and time again. Even in the Sermon on the Mount, when he's preaching, he's combating against a culture that is not with him. That's why he says, you've heard it said, but I say. The Hebrew writer offers a long treatise against sound doctrine because those in the faith wanted to go back to their old ways and worship Moses and worship angels. And look what the Hebrew writer says in one chapter, chapter 1, verse 1. He says, long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophet. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, whom he, uh, through whom he also created the world. And look in chapter five, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child, but solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. And hear me, please. There is both good and evil in the world. There is both a right and a wrong. 
And we've got to stop acting like everything is this squishy, middle, gray things. And we have to speak truth to a culture. Jude, in another short book that deals with discernment in wicked times, he says this, Beloved, although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Are you contending or are you just surviving? Are you discerning the times that we live in? Or are you just letting everything happen to you? Every writer in the New Testament, every writer is addressing some form of false gospel or doctrine in their day. Look at Revelation. Let me show you this. Revelation 2. And to the angel of the church of Pergamum, write, the words of him who has sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Look at the good. Here's what the writer of Revelation says. You hold fast to my name and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who is killed among you where Satan dwells, the bad. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught that taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against with, with the sword of my mouth. Look at verse 19. I know your works, your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into a great tribulation unless they repent of her works and I will strike her children dead. So I want you to see this. He's pointing to the fact that Pergamum and Thyatira had people come in with false doctrine and the church stands condemned because they put up with it. That's what he's saying. They did not discern truth from error and because of it, they will be judged. And I could go through book after book after book in the New Testament. We would be here all day, but the point is this discernment and understanding the truth is absolutely vital to a church health. We cannot be casual about it. The New Testament writers were constantly fighting battles within the church and even the saints after them fought battles after battles after battles. Athanasius fought a battle for the Trinity and the Incarnation. St. Nicholas, where we get our idea of St. Nick, this will change Christmas for you forever. At one of the councils got so mad at one of the other preachers about his lack of truth that he walked up to him in the council and punched him in the face. Merry Christmas. The writers of scripture, you have to understand, equated mature believers as those being ones that could detect truth from error. And a faithful church and a faithful people are not ones who allow anything to come in without scrutiny. Rather, a faithful church is going to be a church where its people know how to rightly discern truth from error. So today, I want to give you some practical tips on how to really understand truth. A full disclosure, not all these ideas are mine. I give credit to people like Tim Challies and Watchman Nee and other scholars who've written prolifically on the subject. But this is radically important. Please, please, please don't discount today because it feels more like a lecture, but please understand these points. Five ideas on how to develop discernment. Number one, believe. The Bible makes it clear that you will never be able to fully discern truth without having belief in God and in his Christ. 
Look at 1 Corinthians 2. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are folly to him. And he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one for who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbeliever to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Hebrews eleven six, and without faith, it is impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Belief is essential to understanding truth and it's essential to discernment. You see, discernment is separating divine truth from error and half-truth. And we as believers have to have it. Let me give you an example of this. When you read the Bible as a Christian, you can clearly see and understand how the word of God points to Christ. Like I really struggle with people who don't understand how the Old Testament is a shadow of things to come. I, I wrestle with that. And, and my Jewish friends, we wrestle with it. And I'm like, why don't you understand this? This is just clear as day that this festival looks like Christ, that this celebration looks like Christ, that this character in the Bible represents Christ. It looks like him over and over and over again. But the reason they can't put the pieces together is that they are blinded by the gods of this age. So Paul is saying that belief is a prerequisite to understanding the word of God. Remember, when Philip in the book of Acts appears, which is just amazing, right? He just appears by a chariot. And there's this Ethiopian eunuch reading the scroll of Isaiah. And he has no idea what he's reading. And so Philip comes along and says, let me help you understand what this is. And he guides him into a belief in Christ. And the light bulb goes off. Belief is a prerequisite to understanding. Psalms tells us that the person who lacks belief is a fool. And I love this quote because it paints the picture vividly. It's a definition of theology by Anselm of Canterbury that says, faith is seeking understanding. An act of loving God means that you're seeking a deeper understanding of him. So faith brings a love for trying to understand the mysteries of God, but you can't get there without a belief in God. Number two, don't be guided by your emotions. While it's true that God has given us emotions, we are created with emotions, we are shown or told time and time again that emotions can lead us astray. Proverbs 29, 11, a fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. Proverbs 28, 26, whoever trusts in his own mind is full, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Proverbs 25, 28, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and is de desperately sick. Who can understand it? Here's what you have to understand about the Bible. Sinlessness and being guided by your emotions is often connected. Look at Ephesians 4. Be angry, emotion, and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your, on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Do not allow the enemy to make sin with your emotions. Watchman Nee, who was credited as the Chinese leader of the church, and that is his pseudonym, Watchman Nee. He says this, Emotion is the lowest, the most unreasonable part of the soul, yet it exerts the greatest power in swaying the will. Whatever emotion is attached to, the will will usually agree. For emotions act like a favored child who always gets what he wants with a few cries before his mother. It seems that his in, the entire life of a person is controlled by emotion, by what it likes or seeks after. Indeed, it's like, it's like or 
dislike is rather irrational. However, if it comes under the control of the spirit, it cannot act so independently as it wishes. It has to yield to God's approval. See, we are in a war for control. And often that control is emotions. Listen, believer, if you can just get a hold of your emotions and your tongue, you would start seeing the work of sanctification take part in your life. Jesus understood this war well. That's why he tells his disciple, if anybody would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Why do we deny ourselves? Because we are riddled with emotional responses. You know how I know? Because I play golf. Just a nine-hole period. Golf, I'm an emotional wreck. I played a couple, <laughs> amen, you've never seen me play, but okay. I played a couple of weeks ago and, and for whatever reason, guys, I was Tiger Woods on the golf course or Scotty Sheffield. I was killing the ball. And the, all the guys around me, they're like, man, I thought you don't play. I'm like, I don't. I don't, they're like, what's the deal? I said, I don't know. I'm just zen. I see the ocean. It's just zen right now. I'm like, good. But I know that if I don't watch my emotions, my emotions can take over me and I lose all rational thought. This isn't a proud dad story for me, but I remember my wife reminded me because I dropped a big deal of tomato sauce on her rug and she's in Oklahoma right now and I had to confess to her and, and she reminded me that there was a time that my daughter was my oldest, when she was 10, 11, she was really into makeup and stage makeup, and she spilled a whole batch of fake blood on her carpet. And I lost it. Like blind rage lost it. You ever been there where just your emotion takes over and you cannot think rationally? And I still to this day wonder what emotional damage I did to my daughter. And and I repented over and over and over for that. But here's the point. Our emotions can lead us down a path in a direction where we no longer understand truth. But number three, you have to maintain a high view of Scripture. While I believe that God still communicates to us today, I believe we have an epidemic of people who want to have a fresh revelation of God for today all the time. There are whole cottage industries for this, guys. And here's what you have to know, that, that God reveals himself primarily through Scripture. I don't understand God's character unless he reveals it to me through Scripture. I don't understand how he feels about sin unless he reveals it through Scripture. I don't know how he rescues me unless he reveals it through Scripture. I don't know how to pray unless he reveals it through Scripture. You see the point? That God reveals himself to us through Scripture. Now, does that mean that God doesn't nudge me or lean a direction or pulls me certain ways? Absolutely not. He does, but it always is submitted to the authority of Scripture. And the great tactic of the enemy today is asking, did God really say? Or is what God said really relevant? You see, God has given us his word for a reason. And it's important as charismatic believers, and I am one of them, that we maintain a high view of Scripture. We are not told to meditate on our thoughts, whether we, rather we are told to meditate on His Word. Thinking deeply about the mysteries of God. 
When you look at Psalm 119, it actually lays out like the Hebrew alphabetical uh, acrostic on the beauty of his word. It's like A, B, C, D, so that people could memorize it. And the psalmist writes this, I have stored your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. He didn't say I've I've stored my opinions or my emotions. He said, I have stored my word, your word in my heart. The reason believers today have such a difficulty with sin is they have not done enough work in storing that word up in their hearts. I could go on and on and on, but the point is clear that God chose to reveal himself through his word. Now, everybody in Pentecostal circles sometimes goes, I just want to hear God speak to me and I understand that desire. And sometimes when they're really pressing me, Jason, I just, I really want to hear God speak to me. I really want to hear an audible voice from God. You want to hear an audible voice from God? Read his word out loud. If you look at my Bibles, I write in them and often times they are things that God is revealing to me through his word. There there are things that were always there, but quite possible I didn't see them because I was not ready to have them be revealed to me. Think of it in terms of a child. When they are born, they have fingers and legs and a tongue, but it's not until they reach a certain milestone that they begin to use them. It's the same way God communicates through his word. If you want to be transformed, read his word. We can't abandon it in favor of our emotions. Fourthly, understand the timelessness of our faith and do not replace it for something new. Look at Acts 17. Luke is writing about Paul's missionary journeys and he says, Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica, meaning those Jews in Berea. They received the word with all eagerness examining the scripture daily to see if these things were so. These men would diligently search the ancient truths of God's word. And then then Luke contrasts them with the Athenians. He said, now the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. The Athenians would embrace everything and anything. And much of Western Christianity is Athenian. We are, we are quick to embrace new ideas and concepts. Yet we have to understand that we have an ancient faith that has been tested by time and time and time again. Our faith is timeless and doesn't need new additions. Robert Schindler, who was a great friend to the great Charles Spurgeon, said in theology, that which is not new Uh, I'm sorry, in theology, that which is true is not new, and that which is new is not true. I think oftentimes the reason we are looking for newness is that we are bored with the gospel. We get bored. But listen, my friends, the gospel is not bored. Show me anything else that can redeem sinners to be righteous. Nothing else can. Until you have a perfect handle on God's revealed word and can fully grasp the mysteries of God in his revealed word, then stop searching for something new. Be an expert in the word. And finally, I'm closing. If you want to discern, test and assess the words put before you. Watch the preacher several years ago on TV that if I named him, you would know him. And he made this statement. You don't, you need, he, he made this statement. God doesn't determine when you die. You determine when you die. This man has a following of hundreds of thousands. And yet he's spewing blasphemy. Because the word of God says it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. 
But oftentimes us Christians hear those one-liners and pull out our hankies and start waving and dancing and shouting, not even realizing what is being said to them is absolute rank heresy. So when you encounter a teaching or a doctrine that requires discernment, you ask two questions, really four. The first thing you need to ask is what is being said? Listen to me. Even when I stand up here and preach, or your new pastor stands up here and preach, pull out all the fluff, pull out all the emotion, pull out all the jokes, all the humor, and go, what was being said? Secondly, what's at stake? What's at stake? So often we come in on a Sunday not realizing that what we do has eternal value. I have a responsibility to preach the truth. Jesus said this, for someone who doesn't preach the truth, they, they might as well wrap a cord around their neck, tie it to a millstone, and throw them off into the middle of the abyss. Have you ever seen a millstone? I have. There are actually some in Capernaum, around the Sea of Galilee. They're about the size of a Volkswagen bus. A, a Volkswagen Beetle. Bus may be an overstatement. Huge concrete block millstone. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying this. If you teach falsely, it's better for you to make a rapid descent to hell. That's what he's saying. Truth matters. What we do here matters. What I do here every single Sunday or wherever I preach, I have a responsibility to tell you the truth. You test and assess the words. You have a responsibility as a congregation to test and assess what is being put before you. What does this word say about God? What does this say about the Bible? What does it say about the character of God? Test and assess. So what are we to do with this? Well, first of all, if you do these things, you do them consistently, persistently, with intensity, because the truth matters. It just does. But I can tell you that if you do these things persistently and consistently with intensity, your life will begin to grow and blossom and flourish. I've seen it time and time again. Do not be passive participants in this church. Do not sit on the sidelines. Do not sit on your hands, but actively engage the word of God. And I promise you, it will bring transformation to your life.